Greetings and welcome to Flanagan's Ecologic. I am your host, Ted Flanagan. And for this episode of Ecologic, we're joined by John Perlin. He has just updated a book called A Forest Journey, The Role of Trees in the Fate of Civilization. Excited to have a discussion with John today. Hey, John, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? Well, I'm uh, doing fine, uh, despite the fact that the uh, sun isn't shining today. We've had a lot. Of, we've had a lot of rain in California. We have. And you're in Santa Barbara right now, which, of course, what, a few years ago, you had those awful mudslides. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, I actually appreciate them because uh, I like to go fossil hunting. And uh, the more slide you have, the more... Um, rock uh, you have to uh look at for fossils you're really you're really uh looking for the very best and what, what for many people is a, a disaster right i mean it's my uh day in the uh flood <laughs> some people have a day in the sun i have a day in the flood how long have you lived in the santa barbara area about uh 30 years and, and before that you were uh, as we were talking you were you were born and raised in, in Los Angeles, right? Born and raised in L.A., and so was my uh, parents, and so were my grandparents. So where did, wait, where did you go? Talk about your, your youth. What were you, where did you go to college? What were you thinking about? Well, actually, I began my interest in trees um, with uh, when I was 11 years old, and I, uh, there was this contest for uh, kitty kids in the uh, funny papers, comics, uh, it was called Ask Andy. And I asked the question, if a, if a tree is, if a seed is so small, why are trees so tall? And uh, that won me the uh, first book of trees. Really, really. Really, really. So now when I, we're gonna get more into this when we get into the discussion. I, I, I've, I've had you very much pegged in my mind as an expert on the history of solar power which you are because that's one of your great one of the great books that you've done but but it sounds like trees were really even more fundamental to your environmental roots well actually um the solar book is what uh, my work in solar history is what led me into uh, the forest book uh because every time uh, people turned to uh, like solar architecture and antiquity. I found the reason was they were running out of wood. Uh, so finding this happening in the Roman times, Greek times, ancient Chinese times, I asked the question, um, wood must have been pretty important for uh, societies to uh, heat their uh, homes for, you know, with, you know, the primary fuel. So it must have played a major role in society, just as uh, fossil fuels have played a major role in our society today. And so that let me on to the research, uh, which uh, culminated in the uh, book you have right now. Yeah, let's, so let's just let's just jump l jump right to that, and we can kind of okay. go, you know back and forth in the timeline. But but here I've got your new book, The Forest Journey. Now, this is a uh, uh, five hundred pages or four hundred page four hundred plus pages of uh, it's five hundred pages five hundred pages of uh, pithy, uh, pardon the pun, <laughs> information about about trees. Um, and this is uh, the. This is an updated version, right? You, you came out with this originally in 1989, is that right? Correct. Uh, but the real difference is uh, actually uh, one is access to the internet. There wasn't an internet back then. And uh, two, uh, I'm a member of the um, University of California, Santa Barbara, and they have a, a digital uh, collection of journals that they didn't have before. And uh, so much has happened in forestry in the last 30 years. And also all the new scholarship in the ancient world has, uh, you know, grown too. Um, so um, the book is uh, basically a very enlarged version. It's 100 pages, 150 pages more than previous edition. And it includes uh, much more. Uh, for example, the uh, original book went, back only 5,000 years. Uh, this book uh, goes back 385 million years with the first true tree, which was discovered after the first edition was published. Is that right? Yeah, and I, I, I was fascinated by that. I, I read about that, that the tree, uh, and I, I can, I'll butcher the name, but it's 
Archaeopteris or something like that? Yes, you got a, a, a trophy uh, for pronunciation. Okay. And, Arche- and you said 385 million years ago, and I was fascinated by this as I skimmed through parts of the book, that 385 million years ago, this tree uh, had properties where it would uh, absorb CO2 and, and, you know, I guess it's sort of more accelerated photosynthesis. And therefore, the, the CO2 levels in the environment came down or the oxygen levels came up to a point that would support life as we know it. Well, actually, uh, its deep roots played a more important role than photosynthesis, which is uh, what trees, re- how really how trees really take down the CO2 is the roots of a tree. Um, you might say, gather the supplements, the, uh, the vitamins that a tree requires, like calcium, magnesium, uh, phosphorus. And um, not all of that, uh, those supplements are used by the tree. You know, like uh, it's like leaving, a, um, a, you know, a food on the table after dinner, like you don't eat all the, all the, all the lima beans, for example, and, you know, uh, which, which I didn't when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. And, <laughs> and so what happens is that those leftovers uh, go back into the soil. They combine with the rainwater, which is basically diluted carbon dioxide, and they lock in the carbon dioxide as a carbonate and that becomes like calcium carbonate, which is limestone. It flows down uh, from the uh, soil to the rivers, to the sea, and gets locked in as limestone. And there you have your sequestered carbon dioxide. Fascinating. Fascinating. So now, for some reason, that tr- that tree species 385 million years ago played this pivotal role on our planet. It did. And one of the reasons it played that role was it was the first true tree and its roots, like I said, uh, and and the photosynthesis together um, were um, ab- enabled uh, the d- beginning of the great takedown of carbon dioxide on the planet. Um, you can see a huge uh, increase of oxygen and a huge decrease of carbon dioxide with the advent of uh, trees over the uh, hundreds of millions of years. And so this shows the value of trees today because these tr- the first true tree uh, was able to spread because there was only one continent, one huge continent called Gowandaland. So there were no like, oh, um, you know, um, barriers to it spread throughout the terrestrial world. And this is why this uh, first, the fossils of this first true tree are found in Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, uh, the Catskills in New York, uh, Ireland, um, Morocco, um, uh, South Africa and Australia, and all the way north to uh, Spitsbergen, which is the big island um, in the Arctic Circle by uh, Norway. So it's ubiquitous. It was ubiquitous everywhere in the um, ancient world. And this was this, as you said, this was found out after you had written the original version back in 1989. Right in 1990, they had discovered 150 fossilized uh, 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 trunks in Morocco, and they were able to um, delineate from those very large fossils uh, exactly the uh, anatomy of the, that tree. And that's why it became known, Archaeopteryx became known as the first true tree. And ever since then, uh, they've increased the amount of fo- fossil discoveries. In fact, only three years ago, uh, they discovered uh, huge roots in the um, Catskills of New York. And I actually, uh, if you can wait a second, I can run and get you, because I, I actually, uh, one of my... Um, uh, ways of doing research to make it really feel like I'm really, uh, I really understand it is to put my boots on and go. And so for two weeks, I dug fossils of Archaeopteryx. And I have, for example, charcoal remains um, from the first, because, because, because the uh, tree increased the oxygen so much that um, for the first time, on the planet, ignition was possible. So you had the first forest fires. And I have those remains 
of uh, they're like charcoal from 385 million years ago. And if you rub your finger on, uh, you know, on the uh, charcoal, uh, it smudges as if it were a forest, fo you know, if it were a campfire uh, yesterday. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So to talk, tell the story uh, of how, how Patagonia came into your life. Because uh, you, you'd written this book, you know, years ago, you'd updated it one other time, but then I, I believe it was the Patagonia folks that came to you and said, we'd like you to really do a significant update. Well, um, the local newspaper, uh, the Santa Barbara Independent, carried a story of uh, a, a symposium I was leading on the, um, it was the first uh, symposium ever done on this woman who discovered that um, in 1856, uh, that uh, um, carbon dioxide uh, was a uh, is a greenhouse gas in 1856, and um, also she wrote that in the leading scientific journal of the day that if there was more carbon dioxide in the uh, atmosphere, the Earth would become a lot ho hotter. And uh, so I conducted this uh, symposium on her and the uh, local newspaper carried a whole story about the symposium and Patagonia being only 25 miles away, read it and um, they immediately sent an email to the editor that they wanted to do a, a version of a forestry for about a decade, but they didn't know where the hell I was. And uh, suddenly all the, um, the big wigs of Patagonia uh, came to a restaurant with me in Santa Barbara and we worked this um, a deal out. And what, what was really funny was uh, I really, you know, really, really pissed them off because, and this is how I do my work. I constantly make new discoveries. You know, my mind's my mind is just that kind of mind, and I'm never satisfied until you know I think I've um, worn every um, route out. And so I'd constantly send to the editor, uh, "This is the last uh, um, update," and then a week later I have another update. And um, that that and so, uh, but then what happened is they came to me. Uh, at a restaurant uh, was uh, and said, we want to give you six more months to write because we want you to do even more updates. Yeah. And so what, what I'd like to say that the uh, what it includes in the new book is, for example, an amazing discovery in Africa that the um, Africa considered like the, you know, the dark continent where only the white people have brought its civilization actually were um, uh, producing from iron or steel a thousand years before the Europeans. And this, of course, required tremendous amounts of wood, uh, you know, to smelt the metal. And uh, the thesis of, of, of a forest journey is that civilizations um, de have depended in times past basically on wood because it's their primary fuel, primary building material, no wood, no ships, uh, no wood, no fuel uh, to get into the Middle Ages, for example. Right, and I, I want to talk. I want to hear some more examples of of how civilizations have depended on wood. You called in the book. You called wood what humanity's most essential material. And well, it, 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 unsung hero. I like the unsung hero. Concept. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's true. I mean, just think of it. First of all, um, our um, okay. Um, had Archaeopteryx not shown up, um, we no no creatures of very large size could have ever come onto you know terrestrial Earth uh, because of the fact that there wasn't sufficient oxygen to metabolize until this first tree began the um, you might say the um, oxidation of the atmosphere um, mm -hmm. and also. Um, the temperatures were too hot and the decarbonization of the atmosphere and they call them a large vascular plants which are trees and which was Archaeopteryx uh, brought this down and created a livable earth for you and me right so just in that fact there would be no you know you know humans 
uh, on this earth, if not for the uh, trees uh, taking all this carbon out and putting all this oxygen in. And now what we're doing is by burning fossil fuels, these trees were like, um, oh, they, they the, the big you know trunks got buried in the uh, earth. And so it sequestered the carbon for hundreds, if not uh, uh, tens of hundreds of millions of years. So it kept all this uh, CO2 out. And so what do we humans do is we dig it up and burn it and we reverse the process which Archaeopteryx began. Right. And and then, I mean, compounding the issue, like you said, over the past 12,000 years, 50% of the world's forests have been cut down. Precisely. And uh, it, the majority began 5,000 years ago with the first uh, civilized uh, area called Uruk, which is located in the Fertile Crescent. And that's when you began the uh, major destruction of the woods uh, throughout the world. And why, and, and John, why is that? I mean, you must have a sort of a personal theory uh, or belief that, why is it that man uh, sees a beautiful forest and instead of taking what uh, he or she needs, cuts the whole cuts the whole shooting match down? I well, mean, because, because people, um, uh, we call it hubris, uh, where um, you want to be the, I don't know. Uh, you you have kids. Did you ever read uh, read them? Yertle the turtle. I think so. Yes. Okay. Well, it's, it's, it's I call it the Yertle the turtle complex, where you know the king of the turtles wanted to have a good view because all of the land he could see uh, belonged to him. So what he did is he piled turtle over turtle over turtle so he could like be the top turtle right and that's the story of uh humanity every someone wants to be the top turtle and so they uh need uh to um you know build like uh, and that's what happened actually in uruk which was the first civilized city um is gilgamesh uh wanted to be the king turtle right and so he uh went out and did um what was called the forest journey where he um, led his men to um, the great cedar forest. It's hard to believe, isn't it, that uh, in the mountains above uh, Iraq were once uh, equivalent to uh, the redwoods and uh, cut down the cedar forest to build a great city where his name would uh, persist uh, for, um, you know, infinity. And there just was no, it was just no, it was just still a frontier mentality, I guess. There was no sense of forest practices, of forest management, that we would need these resources over time. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because we believe that the frontier is basically an American experience. Uh, what I discovered in doing a forest journey, that a frontier is a universal experience where, for example, um, Gr Greece, for example, looked to Rome for its woods. Uh, Rome uh, look to uh, France, North Africa, and England for its woods. England um, look to North America for its woods. And so it's been a continuous process over the thousands of years because wood is essential for one shipbuilding until the Merrimack and the Monitor, the two ironclads, went to it in 1862. Every ship was uh, made of wood. And if you didn't have wood, you didn't have ships. And if you didn't have ships, you didn't have sea power to uh, conduct trade. Uh, for example, in England, they called it the wooden walls of England is what made England great. And England then ran out of wood. And they saw all these great forests in North America. And they said, let's go for it, right? Because we want to be uh, the king turtle. And were we at that time was, you know, large amounts of wood of timber were being actually exported from from North America back to Europe? Oh God. oh, God, yeah. Like, like, uh, uh, for example, the uh, masting trees, the great white pines of New England, which is almost a joke now because, you know, there, you know, no one can even uh, conceive that in New England they had, you know, uh, trees commensurate to the redwoods uh, growing from uh, 
northern Massachusetts all the way up to Maine. And so the uh, English, um, because they had these ships that had 200, 300 guns, so you had to have great mass to uh, stabilize the ship. And so the masting timber from New England became imperative uh, for the continuation of the English empire. And that's what led to revolution because the Americans started to say, well, if uh, England needs to take our wood to be so great, why don't we just use our wood to be great ourselves? Yeah. So it's once again, the year old, the turtle effect, right? Uh, everyone wants to be king, um, you know, king of the turtles. Really very, very interesting. Let, let's talk a little bit about um, forests and rainfall because this was something that I had never th thought about. And I, I think we were all taught in elementary school that, that rainfall is a result of uh, ocean, uh, ocean and lakes and, and waterways uh, evaporating and creating clouds that, that ultimately result in precipitation. But I think you're saying in this book that a lot of rainfall is the result of forests and, and trees bringing that water up. Well, I mentioned that uh, one of the... Um... Well, why I'm so happy that a new edition came out is the last 30 years has been revolutionary for discovering what trees really do. And one of the um, services they do for us, and, and also I may add how unappreciated they are, is that uh, they discovered, and like you said, the stereotype is that uh, all the water uh, like bodies like lakes and uh, ocean the evaporation creates the rain. But two things is one, it's been uh, now um, concluded scientifically that trees uh, create at least 40% of the uh, local precipitation, but they also serve, and this is even more significant, they serve as relays for um, precipitation in distant areas. Uh, so for example, the Congo Basin uh, serves um, provides the Nile with 40% of its water. Um, the um, Siberian and Scandinavian woods uh, provide China with uh, the majority of their um, precipitation. The Amazon provides uh, Buenos Aires, for example, and Sao Paulo with the majority of their precipitation. You cut these trees down and there's no water. And last time I heard water is uh, very important. But you're saying when, when you're saying these these are regional transfers, right? So that right. somehow a forest in, in one region is going to put enough moisture up into the air that those clouds are going to travel to another region and dump the water. Is that definitely definitely that's what we're saying here? That's so, what we're saying here, so, and also what they believe too is, and this is the newest scholarship, is that um, it also creates a movement of uh, atmosphere. Um, and actually, the ocean evaporation would leave the rest of the world in desert if you didn't have the trees relaying the, um, what, you know, the, the precipitation that's caused by evaporation of the oceans over the uh, land masses. Because once you got, if, if you had like a, a desert 500 miles in from the um, ocean, uh, there would be no relaying of that precipitation and the world would um, get them very thirsty. Right. Now, I don't, how do you raise awareness about that? I mean, we're talking about international, I mean, not just regional, we're talking international cooperation based on hydrologic cycles. And, and in this case, the, the role of trees, but how do you get, don't you, isn't there a, a lack of awareness in this area? Well, that's why I wrote the book. And that's why we're having this show is to inform people about what trees really do. And uh, that's what I hope to get across as one, um, we could have never had um, large animals on the earth with um, actually Archaeopteris. Um, what's really interesting, actually sort of like a magnet brought the first um, fish that had lungs and had like uh, ability to walk on land. Uh, and enabled them to find a refuge uh, from the, I don't know if you've ever seen the Devonian fish, like their one third jaw or something. And they have teeth that are, I have some teeth here from, uh, you know, the Devonian period that I dug from the Archaeopters uh, finds and um, allowed them to settle on earth and were their descendants. 
so if not for Archaeopteryx, we wouldn't be having this show right now. Right, right. So just that alone should alarm people that, in fact, the end Permian extinction 100 million years after Archaeopteryx showed up, um, the deforestation uh, created a situation where um, almost all land animals uh, died. Uh, what happened was, as uh, the trees um, like uh, died, there were no, there were there was not vegetation for the herbivores, and the herbivores died, and so the carnivores had no food, right? And so everything collapsed. So, are you then, given your knowledge of the of the value of trees in in managing carbon in in the in on Earth? Are you optimistic that we that we really, if we could get our act together, that we we really do have the ecosystems in place that can that can toggle carbon dioxide levels down? Well, I, I plan to be like uh, John the Baptist, and I hope to uh, spread the word of the importance of trees. And this is why um, I created in this new uh, Patagonia book the whole story of how trees are even more important for the survival of civilization than they were in times past. So it's not a story of just what happened in the past, but it's actually a prediction of what can happen in the future if we don't um, get our act together and stay out of the forest. How about, uh, how, how, how do you package this information? Now you've, you've written this amazing uh, tomb, this huge, uh, uh, Huge uh, Bible encyclopedia, I guess, would be a more appropriate way of putting right. it. Are, are there anybody taking and putting out an abbreviated version of this? Uh, actually, Patagonia uh, plans to do that. Uh, but um, I've been told, actually, the a person who did the audio book uh, for um, uh, Penguin Random House, uh, he spent 30 hours of uh, reading this book for uh, audio, you know, uh, you know, um, audio book. Uh, he said, um, and I felt very complimented that this was the nicest um, oh, uh, written book he's ever read. So what I tried to do, I don't know if, how you feel about it, but uh, I tried to create a story uh, in the words of the people in each time period that I gained from uh, learning how to say wood, how to say pine tree, how to say oak in Latin, in uh, cuneiform. You're familiar with cuneiform. You know, the first, uh, it was the first, it's like wedges uh, the uh, in clay, the first written language. And um, Greek, uh, Latin, and, uh, uh, you know, Spanish and Italian. Uh, so I could go to the lexicons and find out where all the information of trees were from primary sources to give the reader a feeling of um, a con people contemporary to each culture, how they felt about wood. For example, the Romans had a saying that, oh, um, uh, just like uh, we say, um, uh, you know, as redundancy, you know, getting uh, coal, uh, bringing coal to Newcastle, uh, they had a saying, bringing timber to the forest. You know, um, going all the way back in your career, uh, is it true that you were also a professor of physics? Not, I'm not a professor of physics. I What happened was, and this is uh, uh, the first edition of A Forest Journey, is there was a professor at uh, UCSB, University of California, Santa Barbara, who um, I, I, I would take probably too much time. Let's say I met him on a bus and I gave him a review of the first edition. Three weeks later, he called me up and said, this is one of the five best books I've ever read. And uh, two years later, he wins the Nobel Prize. And he invites me to be in the physics department. And uh, he uh, was the top uh, uh, physicist in the world, uh, Dr. Walter Cohn. And um, we uh, worked and uh, in the physics department. We actually did a documentary called The Power of the Sun. Um, it was the it's called it's called the, the history of uh, the science of light and its relationship to photovoltaics and we did multiple projects together and he dubbed me like nine years after um he first brought me in as a uh, physicist 
and this is the top top this was the top gun in physics in the world so here i am like dubbed uh i, I I'm, not, I'm not sure sir john perlin but uh physicist john perlin <laughs> Well, you certainly have a grasp of uh, some really big, uh, big uh, topics and big, uh, big views of the world. I, it's been really delightful talking to you about it, John. Uh, I know you've got your bicycle there. You, you, you've told me that you're, uh, that is your sole means of transportation. Uh, how else do you keep balance in, in how, do you, how do you keep balance? You've got your, your brain is obviously going strong. How do you keep balance in your life? Well, first of all, uh, I actually have done some practical uh, non-solar, non-wood things like uh, I was a single parent, uh, raised a boy who's now 32, who has his doctorate in uh, organic chemistry from UCLA. So that was a uh, balanced project. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, I probably, I mean, you know, as a parent too, that will keep you on your toes in reality. <laughs> For sure. You know, my, my kid, he, he's pretty convivial and he's not a lab rat but he's uh he's smart and also um i go out and uh fossil hunt uh i love that i found lots of petrified wood uh i never imagined that there'd be petrified wood in santa barbara and i found huge amounts of petrified wood in the rocks and actually uh yes two days ago um as i told you earlier Oh, um, I'm one for um, more and more uh, erosion because that brings the rocks down to my grasp uh, to, 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 you know, to open up and find new things. And that's actually what I've done throughout my life is open up um, uh, um, um, new uh, rocks and finding, um, you know, knowledge that nobody thought existed like with the history of solar at first when i uh, embarked on that project people would laugh and say well it's going to be really a thin book right and it turned out to be uh 480 pages and then a forest journey opens up it opened up for me a whole new way of looking at the world uh because if not for trees you and i wouldn't be talking John. Thanks so much. You've really enlightened. You've enlightened me and you've enlightened our, our listeners. So thanks again. And we're going to have another conversation about uh, about Let It Shine, the 6,000 uh, year history of the solar industry. Well, I'd love to do that. You know, I'm here and, uh, you know, the paperback just came out uh, like about eight months ago. Very good. Thanks again. Okay. Bye-bye. Got it. That's it. Thanks for listening to Flanagan's Ecologic. We'll see you next time.